Hi there. Welcome to another edition of Gateways to Glendale College. I'm your host, Deb Kinley, and today we're going to be speaking with Bart Edelman. Bart, how are you doing today? Just wonderful. Great to see you, Deb. Good to see you, too. So tell us how you're connected with GCC. What do you do? I've been teaching at Glendale College for 36 years. Um, this is my last year. I'm going to retire in June. <laughs> at such a young age. <laughs> at such a wonderfully, remarkably young age. Um, I was very lucky. I began teaching at 24. Mm -hmm. And Glendale has uh, offered me wonderful opportunities. Uh, teaching, traveling to get grants, fellowships. So it's been an absolutely wonderful place and creatively. Uh, it's uh, helped my writing because I've had summers off sometimes if I didn't have fellowships. Mm -hmm. And I've had the most wonderful students in all that time. Taught a plethora of different classes. Okay, so what kinds of classes do you teach? I've taught everything from uh, English 120 to uh, Introduction to Poetry, Humanities, Creative Writing, 20th Century, American Literature. Smattering of courses, as they say. Sounds very interesting, and over the years, I'm sure the subjects kind of, the, the theories are maybe the same, but the subjects change, or is it the other way around? Uh, both. I think uh, a whole different student population. Mm -hmm. uh, watching the college go uh, from a small community college to a much larger with different campuses mm -hmm. and then seeing of course what's going on now the frightening financial mm -hmm. situation and uh, so I've, I've watched the college go through many many different changes. So do you have um, typical students? How would you describe some typical students you've had? All, all across the board I have students um, especially in the poetry and the creative writing classes, who are just beginning writers. Some of them have never written a poem before. I have students who have published poems. Uh, in the last couple of semesters, I've had students who actually had their uh, master's degrees in creative writing who are coming back to school. Uh, sometimes they can't find a job. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they've come home to live with their parents. So, so many different students and so many different students from uh, different backgrounds, which always makes it such an interesting heterogeneous group. That's the beauty of Glendale College. The students come from all over the world and educate us as we help them. Absolutely, very much so. We're going to be showing some clips from an event that you held at the Ruskin in Los Angeles. Um, would you like to tell us who we'll be seeing? Yeah, um, the Ruskin Art Club is, I think, the second oldest club in Los Angeles in terms of providing uh, poetry, music, art events. And um, what we're going to see are some Glendale College uh, poets because they're reading from uh, The Eclipse, mm -hmm. which is our uh, Glendale College uh, journal, which are so kind to show. <laughs> and that's a journal that in 2000 uh, became a national journal. For 10 years before that, we were just publishing um, our students. And we got a grant in 2000 uh, that allowed us to publish writers from all over the world. So we have our students side by side uh, with writers that they have uh, studied in their textbooks. Very good. And the Ruskin reading, uh, we had about, I think, seven uh, readers, uh, and two of them were from Glendale, Glendale College. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to hear them and see them read. Okay, and you also are participating in the uh, I was moderating. Okay. I was moderating. Uh, so no, I was, not, I, w I was not reading. I was moderating and facilitating, as they say. Encouraging, I yeah, suppose. Oh, <laughs> terribly <laughs> encouraging, every one of those students, yes. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll take a look at our Glendale College students at the Ruskin. Um, our next reader is David Garion. Uh, David Garion studied creative writing at Glendale College. Uh, he attends Cal State Northridge. He has appeared in three different issues of Eclipse. He is a devoted painter. And uh, may we have a warm welcome for a new writer, David.
It doesn't feel too bad up here. <laughs> All right. Well, my first poem is actually written in a creative writing class that I took with Bart. It was a couple, maybe three years back. And I didn't really re like writing formal poetry, but it was a requirement. So Bart was like, you got to do this. And I said, no, you know, I can't. And eventually I grew to like it, and which was really strange. And now <laughs> I'm going to read this poem. And I guess we all become what we reject in the end, huh? <laughs> 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 well, this one's called Masquerade. The constant talkers are the ones who hide, compelled to mask their true identity, disguised by words of arrogance and pride. And can my heart untie the winding tide release my inner will and fearfully. The constant talkers are the ones who hide. A slight return to generate my guide. I wish to find my flawless entity, disguised by words of arrogance and pride. Deceitful people masquerade untried, creating speech towards obscenity. The constant talkers are the ones who hide. The thinker engineers his words inside, continuing to keep his sanctity disguised by words of arrogance and pride. And men of grace restrain themselves aside, concealing secretive domains to flee. The constant talkers are the ones who hide, disguised by words of arrogance and pride. All right, this one, we're going to loosen it up a little bit. and. I don't really know what to say about this poem, but I don't think I wrote it in the clearest state of mind, but <laughs> you take what you want. <laughs> Exposition Castle, July 18th, 2010. Outside the cramped warehouse, we used to burn sour grass just to look for her once in a while. As always, she emerged from hydrogen cyanide clouds without any precipitation. No one in the circle seemed to notice, but she spoke fluent whiskey well before the rye could catch her tongue. Maybe it was intense introspection, or because the band playing inside had all the wrong notes that allowed us to embrace ignorance. When she left, we somehow managed to stagger through the narrow entrance. Saltwater waves accumulated on our skin. And this last poem I'd like to read is from the current issue of Eclipse. I'm going to back to formality here, but it's okay. You know, we can handle a little outdated ideals once in a while. More of a life than going out. <laughs> what are you going to do? This one's called Yankee Rose. Abandon hope and let addiction reign to cleanse suspended curiosity when simple questions ravish anxious pain. Oblivious retention tempts the same directing trails of animosity. Abandon hope and let addiction reign. Descend the steps and taste the beggar's strain as anger teases generosity when simple questions ravish anxious pain. Subdued awareness terminates disdain, provoking sensitive ferocity. Abandon hope and let addiction reign. Decline possessions sober men attain and show discretion no atrocity when simple questions ravish anxious pain. Impulsive actions breathe to entertain, discharging blood with new viscosity. Abandon hope and let addiction reign when simple questions ravish anxious pain. I'd like to thank Bart Edelman, Red Hand Press, and the people at the Ruskin Art Club for giving me an opportunity to read. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Mary Estrada. Uh, Mary studied creative writing at Glendale College. She now attends Pierce College, and she will transfer to Cal State Northridge. Uh, where she's going to major in Spanish and hope to write more Spanish poetry. Her work has appeared twice in Eclipse. And uh, please, once again, a warm welcome for a new writer.
hardly new professor. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Two years ago, I was a student in Professor Edelman's creative writing class, and I learned to love his poetry. One of the first questions I asked him when I was that if I was the only senior citizen he had ever taught. And he answered, of course, that persons of all ages love to write poetry. One of the assignments in his class was to attend readings such as this one. I became interested in investigating what types of seniors wrote poetry for their pleasure. It really astounded me to find various groups of retired professors of math, physics, chemistry, who were quite accomplished poets. Inevitably, they began their readings by saying, I wrote these poems because once I met a girl. <laughs> well, the first two poems I'll read were written because once a long time ago, I met a man. <laughs> the theme of the first poem is that reflections of our life sometimes evoke understanding that is written in a subtle weave. The poem is called Nightingale Hymns. Melancholy penetrates inward, framed, subdued through depth. Reminiscent portraits reveal inchoate fragments, apparitions, heightened dissonance appears. Prescient yesterday withdraws, its vestiges reach backward on wings that melt and course faster, always faster, and then faint dawn floats end to end throughout. Gazing into the feathery glow, dazzling shards mark traces. Races run, long finishes savored, unhurried essence, threatened, burning feverish. Nameless narratives unfold, footprints fade, imprints remain. Let's profess this space, ebullient enigmas fast imbued, anecdotal music, nightingale hymns. <clears throat> My second reading is a villanelle. Its theme is, if we could gaze into life as we do into a mirror, its many sides could reflect unplanned and unanticipated crossroads. Its title is Glass Moon. We tarried artless seasons traced with sand. The mirror rode its own reflective pose to keep our silver secrets safe in hand. The prancing quick light quivers danced as planned, their map unbroken circles drawn by rows. We tarried artless springtimes traced with sand. Glass moon's lost shadow stalked penumbra's band and grew clear blossoms laced of crystal rose to keep our silver secrets safe in hand. As gentle, wounded breezes bow toward land, the outside world in shimmered teardrops flows through tarried, artless <coughs> summers traced in sand. Rich, caracoled, resplendent realm holds stand, where brilliant crescent rays in rhythmic shows reversed our silver secrets out of hand. Awake to paths formed of blazon span, let's wander wild our mirror repo behind our mirror repose to tarry artless winters filled with sand and cast our silver secrets out of hand. My last reading is a poem about the death of my 19-year-old <coughs> son, which happened many years ago. I thank Professor Edelman for showing me how to put sorrow into words. It's called The Leaden Hour. I know a place to shun the leaden hour. The path was found in pain's profound nadir when life endures, what little left is ours. They came and prayed and sang their hymns most dour. I knew not hope, nor song, nor friend, 
just tears. I know a place to shun the leaden hour. To live is like a grave that grows no flower. Each day you seek to make more reasons clear. When life endures, what little left is ours. With sips, then gulps of grief, you taste the sour. All days remain like dreaded spectral spheres. I know a place to shun the leaden hour. My cradle rocked your early life as bower. Now speak to me. Your sleep transcends, transcends my fear. When life endures, what little left is ours? While demons called remembrance stay devoured, I teach myself to make my soul austere. I know a place to shun the leaden hour. When life endures, what little left is ours? Thank you. Well, that was great, Bart. So I understand you're involved at an event at the Glendale Public Library. Would you tell us about that? Sure, I would love to. Um, in May, I did a reading from my, uh, from my new book, which is called The Geographer's Wife. And uh, we had a wonderful audience. And uh, I've done readings before at the Glendale Public Library. They have a wonderful auditorium. And so uh, I enjoy doing readings there. They are very um, supportive. Mm -hmm. They're supportive of the college, but they're also supportive. Chuck Wyke is especially supportive of my work and my publisher, Red Hen Press. So it's a lot of fun to have Glendale College students there and faculty, staff, and the community. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a, uh, that was a wonderful reading. Enjoyed it very much. Good. I'm a friend of the Glendale Library. Good for you. We <laughs> need all the friends we can get. <laughs> so how many books have you written? I have six books that are out, and the last four are out with uh, last publisher, Red Hen Press. Uh, the first book is called Crossing the Hackensack, which is published in 93, and then Under Damaris's Dress, which was 1996, and then The Alphabet of Love, which was 99, and The Gentleman, 2001, The Last Mojito, 2005, and now The Geographer's uh, Wife, which just came out about three or four months ago. Okay. The Geographer's Wife. Can you tell us how you came to that title and what the book's about, please? Yeah, the book is divided into four different sections, geographical sections, east, west, north, and south. And the book has to do with kind of where we find ourselves in life. Sometimes we're in one area, which metaphorically may have a certain direction, but sometimes we backtrack. We go through all these different phases, landscapes, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was a, a good way to divide the book up. And it was interesting how the poems fell into each section. Uh, so same number of poems in each section, but it provides a thematic aspect and background to the book, which I think unifies uh, uh, the poems. Would you like to read the, the lead poem from the book? Sure. I would, love to, I would love to read The Geographer's Wife. The Geographer's Wife. Pity the poor geographer's wife, who spends most of her life missing him in every isthmus, desert, desert mountain, valley he's had the pleasure to explore. He claims it's not his fault. The field takes him away, draws him east, west, north, and south at a moment's notice, often in the middle of the night while she rises from their tiny bed and he packs a bag of silence only a secret can keep. He swears she knew about his desire, the longing to touch air, land, sea, this need to live a piece of himself wherever he can, survey the climatic conditions of an earth so vast he can barely comprehend it all. When she timidly asks upon each of his returns how it is they cannot travel together, why he will not share his life's work, 
He struggles so with his words. She retreats to her ball of yarn to darn in another sock. Steady yourself for the week they have before his next departure. Ah, yes. Pity the poor geographer's wife who watches the house grow more and more around her every day. Thank you. Um, this last poem is called Go, Prepare, Surrender. I've always been um, intrigued by that word, surrender. And if I'm teaching and I put that on the board, especially in poetry or creative writing class, very often somebody says, surrender, oh yeah, you know, white flag. It's you give up, you give up. And maybe there's not giving up, maybe there's giving in to surrender. Uh, but sometimes surrender can be the exact place that you want to be. Go, prepare, surrender. Tomorrow at dawn, you'll awake to the gift by your side. The one you've awaited, it seems, almost all your life. It will not arrive in the mail. It will not knock upon your door. It will, however, enter unannounced expecting nothing in return for the service it provides. Day by day, you'll discover a certain sense of wonder as it makes itself at home, measuring the space between you and the rest of the world. Soon you'll divine light from the curious shadow thrown, thrown halfway, halfway across, across each room, room, morning, noon, and night. In due time, you may grow so familiar with its presence, you might think it's disappeared but you'll always know it's there. This steady ring of promise you swore you'd never wear. Yet simply, for now, go, prepare, surrender to the future before you. Thank you, Bart. Looked like a really pretty, pretty neat event at the Glendale Library, thank you. So what sort of um, places do you read your material? Um, eh, wow, everywhere. And by that, I just mean it can be bookstores, it can be libraries, community events, um, often at colleges, often as part of, uh, sometimes you, I'll teach a workshop on poetry, and sometimes attached to that um, is, uh, is a reading. I've read, uh, I've read poems at subway stops. Uh, I've read poems, lots of different places. Lots of different places. Okay, yes. very good. Well, I understand you were recently appointed the Creative Writing MFA faculty at Antioch University in Los Angeles. Would you like to tell us what that means to you? Yeah, that was a very, very pleasant surprise. Um, it wasn't anything uh, I had thought of, but I had um, I'd been part of a panel at USC. Uh, and one of the other panelists with a w was a woman who runs the poetry, the MFA program, uh, Jenny Factor. Something must have clicked, and it was about a year later when she called and she said, would you be interested in taking some students? Antioch has uh, a low residency program. So the students are only, they only come to LA maybe 10 days, twice a year. So you work with them during that time. They hear lectures, other poetry readings. Mm -hmm. But the other four or five months, you work with them individually. So I'm a mentor, and I have five students. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them are in Los Angeles. One's in New York, one's in Wisconsin, one's in Chicago. They send me their work. And it's a very, uh, it's a very intimate connection. It's very, very different than the education and the teaching that I've done at Glendale for 36 years. It and kind of turns education a little bit on its ear traditionally. Antioch's a little different kind of school. Yes, I think. it is. If it's, is it safe yes, for me to is. say that? Because there is an Antioch College in Ohio. Is in Yellow it, Springs. In Yellow Springs. Is it connected to that school? It, it originally was connected. And do you know that that school closed for a while? No, I'm not aware of that. No. Financially, mm -hmm. and they are just, if I'm, I, I think I'm correct, they're just starting to build it up again. Okay. But it was originally part of that, and then I believe what happened was um, graduate programs were taken away, some of them taken away. Um, but I, I know the uh, MFA program uh, in LA has been there almost 20 years, and it was the first uh, low residency creative writing program in California 
uh, and it was started by a wonderful woman by the name of Eloise Klein Healy. And low residency, what does that mean? You don't have a lot of students on campus or tell us what more of that means. As I said before, they're only on campus 10 days twice a year, so only 20 days. Okay. Most of the work is being done they mail it, computer. Mm -hmm. So y you have a very intimate connection with these students. Mm. Um, you don't see them that often, although there are some teachers who use Skype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they see their teachers. There are quite a few students also who are from other countries. Mm, okay. And so they use Skype. Okay. Um, I like to telephone and I like to uh, see those Los Angeles students, okay. uh, even across the street at the coffee bean. At the coffee bean, all right. So what, pray tell, are you going to do once you retire? Well, I think I am going to um, definitely uh, continue teaching, hopefully at Antioch. Okay. Um, I want to do more writing. Um, I, there's, there's so many things I'd like to do in terms of uh, workshops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe uh, open up a boot store. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There, there's more than enough stuff. I'm very much looking forward to uh, to June, and probably teach. You know, I probably teach maybe a poetry class in the evenings here. Okay. Lots of opportunities. Lots of opportunities. It doesn't yes. sound like you'll be bored and sitting at home watching. We can't say Oprah anymore. I guess watching. No, I don't <laughs> think I'll be watching TV. Leave It to Beaver reruns, uh, but I might. <laughs> I always like Jerry Mathers. So Every you now never and know. then, you never know. You never know. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with, Bart? Uh, just that, words from, uh, from just that I think this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, you and Scott have both been great, and my time at Glendale College has been uh, wonderful. I love this last year where I'm kind of. Uh, slowly <laughs> going off into the sunset but it's been the most rewarding job and if I had to do it again I think I'd just as much sign up for exactly what I did before that's and I great. think yeah that's that that's really nice that's the best thing I think you could say if you had to do it again you'd do it again I think I would do it again yeah, that's pretty cool. with a smile on my face well, very good sounds very rewarding well, Bart, if we want to find out any more about you, our viewers, uh, how would they catch up with you? Very easily. They can just go to www.bartedelman.com on the World Wide Web, and they will find out lots of information and some really good childhood pictures as well. Childhood pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank well, you. thank you so much for having me, Deb. Thank you so much for coming to the show today. You bet. And thanks for joining us on Gateways to Glendale College. We're always online at www.glendale.edu. And we are on at 7 o'clock on Thursdays and noon on Saturday and Sundays.